Up next, postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Sanjib Hossein. Um, in the summer of 2010, 34 years after his uncle was hanged to death by Bangladeshi military dictator General Zia, Sanjib assisted the preparation of a writ petition. It was filed before the Bangladesh Supreme Court, challenging the execution of his late uncle. Three years later, in 2013, he found himself at the heart of the Shabag movement, amongst hundreds of thousands of Bangladeshis seeking the death penalty for war criminals. All this culminated in Sanjib pursuing doctoral studies at the Warwick Law School, exploring the legality and legitimacy of Bangladesh's fight against impunity. So this is Sanjib's topic today. The floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to express my gratitude to the Lenten Foundation and the Young Academy of Norway for organizing this event and um, um, having me as a participant in this seminar. Um, although it's through a screen, um, it's really nice to see Thurunov again. I'm sure we agree that if Thurun could be here in person, it would be great. But um, life isn't perfect, and sometimes academia and activism isn't perfect either. Um, I'm not much of an academic or an activist. However, as a student of the law, I have had the opportunity to take part in somewhat of um, academia and activism. For me, activism and academia turned out to be deeply personal. Recently, I was reading the memoir by Amorta Shen, and in the preface of this book, Professor Shen talks about the Iranian mathematician Al-Biruni, who spent many years in India. According to Al-Biruni, Indian intellectuals had the most unusual gift of talking eloquently on subjects about which they knew absolutely nothing. <laughs> keeping that in mind, keeping that in mind, the least I can do today is talk about the things I have experienced, whether I fully understand them, or if my actions are legitimate is a different question altogether, and it's a question that I can't answer because I cannot be a judge of my own cause. The hope is that these experiences may have some value to those who think seriously about legal activism. I'd like to tell you about two stories today. The first story relates to me and many others who sought justice for the execution of my uncle on whom a special martial law tribunal passed a death sentence in 1976. The other story relates to my participation in the Shahbag movement in 2013, where we sought justice for the millions who perished at the hands of the Pakistan army and its local auxiliaries during the bloody birth of Bangladesh in 1971. What ties these two events together is how I, someone who belongs to a family that suffered immensely, because of the existence of the death penalty, could then take part in a movement where we sought the death penalty as an ultimate form of punishment for a war criminal. I do have a PowerPoint which contains nine photos. And in the course of this presentation, I'd like to show you these photos in the hope that they will help you understand what it is that I was a part of. The first four photos, which I will show you now, relate to my father's elder brother, Abu Tahir. In Bangladesh, Tahir is adored by many in the political center and left for his role in Bangladesh attaining independence. However, he's also derided by the right wing for his socialist, secular, and egalitarian ideals. So here are four photos. So that's Tahir with his wife. Um, this photo was probably taken in 1974. What you can't see in this photo is that Tahir actually has one leg. The other leg was blown away in the war. And then, of course, this contains many of my family members. It has my father, my aunties, Tahir holding the camera, um, his daughter, his nep nephew. Um, everyone in this photo is alive other than Tahir, of course. This is my grandmother, um, who was 
in this photo, she's been carried to her son's grave um, after, just after he was buried. And this, of course, is a photo from the 1990s. Um, the lady in the photo happens to be the current prime minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina. In this event, she was, to the best of my knowledge, seeking justice for Tahir's execution. So why and how was Tahir executed in 1976, and how did we find justice 35 years after his execution? Tahir was essentially put on trial for treason, for allegedly attempting to overthrow the government and sub subvert Bangladesh's armed forces. The entire trial process from beginning to end took place over a few weeks inside the Dhaka Central Jail. Perhaps the most glaring discrepancy of the trial itself was that the maximum punishment for the crime with which Tahir was charged under Bangladesh's penal code was life imprisonment, not the death penalty. Tahir was denied the right of appeal, while his lawyers were forced to take an oath of secrecy to never discuss matters relating to the trial ever. On the 17th of July, 1976, the Special Martial Law Tribunal constituted by the then military dictator General Zia passed the death sentence on Tahir. Three days later, he would be hanged at the age of 37. For a good number of years after that, the fate of our family was guided by the strength and perseverance of the woman of my family, who held things together because the men were either dead or imprisoned for their political beliefs. Nearly 35 years later, on March 22, 2011, the Supreme Court of Bangladesh declared that the Special Martial Law Tribunal, which tried and convicted Tahir, was barren of lawful authority. So how did we reach this judgment? The story begins with a meeting held in a spring evening in 2010 at the chambers of Dr. Shalin Malik, a leading expert of constitutional law in Bangladesh. It was during this meeting uh, that was initiated by my father that we brainstormed the prospect of challenging the legality and the constitutionality of Tahir's trial and execution. On the guidance and ad advice of Dr. Malik, we took several important decisions that day. We agreed that the way forward would be to file a writ petition before the Supreme Court challenging the legality of the establishment and proceedings of the Special Martial Law Tribunal, which tried and convicted the hair. As our meeting progressed, we shared a unanimous feeling that the court was not a venue to settle political scores. Based on this understanding, we took a strategic decision not to make any political arguments in our writ petition. It was decided that I would assist Dr. Malik in the drafting of this petition. We agreed to keep our discussions amongst ourselves. In light of the declaration of the invalidity of the Fifth Amendment, we felt that there was a good chance that the Supreme Court would respond favorably to our petition. Nevertheless, we also acknowledge that if we shared our plans with others, we would most likely face unwarranted interruptions or interventions from quarters beyond our control that would prevent us from filing our petition and thus began our preparation. In the course of the next few months, after, after multiple trips to the National Archives of Bangladesh, uh, retrieving relevant martial law regulations and historical newspapers, followed by hours of drafting and redrafting, our writ petition was ready. It was as a consequence of the filing of this writ petition that in 2011, 35 years after Tahir's execution, that the Supreme Court of Bangladesh declared that the Special Martial Law Tribunal which tried and convicted Tahir was barren of lawful authority and Tahir's execution amounted to extrajudicial murder. This brings me to the second set of photos which I'd like to share now. This is Jahanar Imam, who is a symbol of resistance and she's known uh, for her fight against impu impunity, uh, against, um, uh, fight, for, uh, fight against impunity. Uh, in the cause of justice for the people who lost their lives during Bangladesh's liber liberation war. The person showing the victory sign is, of course, Abdul Qadir Mullah. Um, uh, he was executed uh, by hanging in 2013 um, in Bangladesh. He is known as a war criminal. And these are photos from the Shahbag movement. How did I find myself in a movement 
demanding the death penalty. On February 13th, 2013, on, on the 5th of February 2013, the International Crimes Tribunal handed down a sentence of life imprisonment on Abdul Qadir Mullah after convicting him for crimes against humanity. In the course of this 15-month-long trial, it had been proved beyond reasonable doubt that during Bangladesh's liberation war, Mullah had actively taken part in the murder of 300 to 350 unarmed civilians and the parents and sisters and brother of Mumina Begum, who appeared as an eyewitness for the prosecution. While being escorted out of the tribunal, Mullah raised his right hand and showed a victory sign before press cameras. Why would someone, just coming to terms with the reality that he would spend the remaining years of his life in prison, show a victory sign? By parting his index and middle finger by 45 odd degrees, many believed that Mullah had sent a message to those who had been waiting for justice for 42 years for the mass atrocities that had been committed against them in 1971. The much anticipated war crimes trials in Bangladesh were gradually rekindling a once lost faith that impunity would not go unchallenged. The message embedded within Mullah's victory sign was a reminder that he had evaded justice for the major part of his life, and even the International Crimes Tribunal had proved itself inept to change that. This was because Mullah would probably be freed from prison if a favorable government returned to power in the future. This was unsurprising, especially since serious offenders from the 1971 war convicted of murder, rape, and arson were unconditionally and illegally released from prison after 1975 by the military dictator, General Zia Rahman. As the news of the sentence of life imprisonment imposed on Abdul Qadir Mullah began to spread, and a small group of young men and women led a procession protesting the verdict to Shahbag, which is a busy intersection at the heart of Dhaka. They believed that maximum punishment, capital punishment, in place of a sentence of imprisonment would have been proportionate to the crimes for which Mullah had been found guilty. The news of this gathering spread quickly. In the following weeks and months, crowds ranging from 100,000 to half a million gathered at Shahbag on a daily basis. An intriguing quality of the Shahbag movement was that its demands were framed and expressed in a carnival-like atmosphere. A BBC correspondent described the affair as an unusual outpouring of, of feeling. Some recited the poems they had written while others sang the songs they had composed. Many things happened in the months following the Shahbag movement, but to cut a long story short, after a lengthy appeal, Mullah's sentence of life imprisonment was increased to the death penalty, and he was executed by hanging after that. To me, the Shahbag movement shouldn't be reduced to many people seeking the death penalty. Rather, Shahbag was a movement where people who had been deprived of justice for the better part of four decades demanded maximum punishment for those found guilty of crimes against humanity. A people living in a society that had never critically engaged with the philosophy, the legitimate philosophy, that the death penalty is inhumane, it is degrading, it is a degrading form of punishment. Because the application of the death penalty remained legally valid and practiced, and was the maximum punishment in Bangladesh, the people who gathered at Shahbag felt that a person who was responsible for the murders of hundreds of people should not receive a life term. How did prominent human rights organizations react to the demands of Shahbag? In one statement after another, human rights organizations claimed that executions by hanging of war criminals will not deliver justice to the people of Bangladesh. I've asked myself, do human rights organizations exercise a monopoly over deciding what constitutes justice and how it ought to be defined? Is it possible that the idea of justice may have plural meanings and interpretations and that it may change from one vantage point to another? Is the act of claiming that one particular understanding of justice is more legitimate than another understanding of justice elitist? How effective are one-page statements 
that issue calls for moratoriums in languages and terminologies that do not speak to societies that have undergone extreme levels of trauma. What does it mean when several hundred thousand people demand the death penalty? With regards to a criminal justice system which was essentially, which had essentially failed to hold to account the perpetrators of the most egregious crimes for the better part of four decades, is it surprising that a large section of the population belonging to that society will equate justice with the imposing of the maximum punishment available to that system? Towards the end of 2013, I arrived in England to pursue doctoral studies at the Warwick Law School. This time, I took off my activist hat and I wore the hat of an academic. And I'll admit, the transition, if there ever was a transition, was not easy. I thought deeply about many of these questions as I explored the legality and the legitimacy of the justice process in Bangladesh that was desperately trying to fight impunity after a long hiatus. So how did I make, a, make sense of it all? I wouldn't be fully honest with you if I said I am able to make sense of it all, but I am trying. The eminent historian E.H. Carr tells us that attaining total objectivity is impossible. Marty Koskuniemi says that when we feel intensely about something we know about, it invariably becomes political. The question is how to be objective about something we feel intensely about. When engaged in legal activism, you'll invariably find yourself tied with causes you feel intensely about. And when you feel intensely about something, the intensity can blind you. But it necessarily doesn't always have to be like that. With the passage of time, by historicizing, by constantly self-reflecting, it is possible to strive to be objective. It's easy to dehumanize the Shahbag movement and to reduce it to many people baying for blood. But I'm afraid that's the easy and lazy thing to do. The job of an academic and a scholar ought to be to understand why so many people would go to such lengths to attain their understanding of justice. In my quest to be an academic, I reached the following conclusion with regards to Shahbag in my doctoral th thesis. And I'm just going to read out two paragraphs from that thesis, and I'm going to end my speech. The chain of events leading to the execution of Abdul Qadir Mullah in December 2013 raises important questions that are likely to pique the interest of those who concern themselves with the mechanics and pitfalls of transitional justice and are keen on using international criminal law as a tool to fight the culture of impunity. One of the reasons why the principle of complementarity identifies national criminal jurisdictions as the first line of attack against the culture of impunity is because it allows justice not just to be done, but to be seen to be done by those who were directly and indirectly affected by the most serious crimes. The first point of tension that complementarity does not account for is the possibility that the process of justice, of local justice, does not, may be prone to be influenced by the sentiments of the victims. By demanding what it understood as justice, the Shahbag movement, which sparked off in February 2013, put to test the very notions of the independence of the judiciary in Bangladesh. If more movements like Shahbag emerged after the judgments failed to satisfy the victim's sense of justice, following which laws were amended and punishments enhanced, the political interference to ongoing justice processes would be apparent, and such events would certainly derail the whole justice process and strip itself of legitimacy. Thank you.